Reading with your kids. Hola, Niho, Kunik, Shiva, Assalamu alaikum, Shalom, Mahaba, Moni Willy Wanji, Namaste, Jambo, Bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast and iHeartRadio Best Kids and Family Podcast Award nominee. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so delighted and so very honored that you are joining us in our mission to help families grow closer through reading. Please be sure to subscribe to the show in the iHeartRadio app on Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher Radio, Ghana, Himalaya, wherever you find your podcast. Our guest today is Mark Brown. He is here to celebrate Believe in Yourself, what we learned from Arthur. Before we invite Mark into the studio, we want to invite you to connect with us on social media. We love connecting with our friends on social media. Facebook.com slash reading with your kids. If you are on Instagram, our handle is at Reading With Your Kids. We have a great Pinterest page titled Reading With Your Kids. You can find us on YouTube. You can also connect with us on Twitter at Jedly Magic. And we would love it if you could join us on our website, readingwithyourkids.com. Go there. You can check out our certified great read wall of fame. Find the next great book to add to your family library. If you're an author, you can find out about our great promotional services. Find out how you can be a guest here on the podcast. It's fun. It's easy. Gives you the chance to tell thousands of people about your fantastic book. You can also use the contact button at the top of the page to send us a message. Let us know what you think we're doing great. Let us know what we could do better. And let us know who you'd like to hear on the show. Do that all at readingwithyourkids.com. Join us right now from Martha's Vineyard in the beautiful state of Massachusetts. Our guest today is, well, he needs no introduction. He's here to celebrate his latest book in the Arthur series. It's called Believe in Yourself, What We Learned from Arthur. Please welcome to the show, Mark Brown. Hey, Mark, how are you? Good to be here. Nice I, to meet you, Jed. So nice to meet you, too. I was sharing with Mark before the show, uh, you know, regular listeners know we've had LeVar Burton on the show, Katie Camello, Brad Meltzer, all these New York Times bestselling authors, Karen Parsons, formerly of the, the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, my wow. wife, oh, that's that's kind of cute. Yesterday, in preparation for the show, Believe in Yourself was sitting on the kitchen table. She came in and she said, I, are you having Mark Brown on the podcast? <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's so cool. <laughs> you've, been, you've been a part of her classroom and so many other classrooms for decades. That's uh, what a testament. Yeah, it's. My, one of my very favorite things to do is to talk to kids at schools. Uh, I love their honesty. Um, I, I was visiting a school one day, and the teacher had this really cool assignment. She had asked the kids, if you were a bumper sticker, what would it say? And I thought, wow, this is okay. Let me think about this. All right, I've got it. My bumper sticker would say, I like all kids and some adults. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I'd like to buy that sticker from you. <laughs> I, well, you know, I think of kids as my boss. Mm -hmm. uh, I got fired from several jobs before I found the right one. And I, I feel great going to work every day out to my studio. Uh, I have the best job for me I could ever imagine. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I do think of kids as my boss and I want to keep my job. <laughs> and you've kept that job. Uh, as I understand it, you created Arthur um, back when I was graduating high school, back in the 70s. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Keep it coming. Just keep making me <laughs> feel so old. <laughs> well, I mean, I was getting out of high school. So. <laughs> well, you know, uh, I, talking about feeling old, but grateful at the same time, this book, when I started Thinking about uh, the whole thing came as a way to celebrate 45 years of books, Arthur books, 25 years of the television show now. And, you know, what could I do? And, and so I wanted to craft a book where I could talk to both the adults mm -hmm. who grew up with Arthur, who are now parents and, and reading Arthur books to their kids. 
And so it was a, a new experience for me. Yeah, yeah. And this certainly is a, a great book for all ages. I, I remember I was mentioning high school. I remember when I graduated high school, one of the gifts that I got was a tiny little book called Everything I Needed to Know in Life on Learning Kindergarten. <laughs> And, <laughs> yeah, and, I remember that book. Yeah, and I turned to my dad and I go, so why am I going to pay for college if I already learned everything? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, but this is a, a great book that has lots of wisdom in it that I think would be a really sweet graduation gift for somebody getting out of high school, getting out of college. Um, yeah. It's surprising how touching uh, giving an adult a uh, uh, you know, a picture book can be, can really be moving. Yeah. I recently started talking to kids in college. Uh, and, I, you know, I was kind of nervous about what kind of reception I would get. And they are the best audience ever. You know, it, it's like it takes them back to their childhood and to this place that's warm and comforting and exciting and so it was a real surprise. Uh, sometimes when I go to a school where many grades are in the same building, you know, a K through eight or even up through 12, I'll be talking to kids in the library and I notice all of these 12th graders kind of coming over and lurking <laughs> close to us. <laughs> and so it's, it's fun that. Arthur still connects with people of all ages. Yeah. So what was the inspiration? What was that spark that uh, brought Arthur to life 45 years ago? Losing my job. <laughs> I, I was uh, sometimes the best things happen when the worst things happen. And I was teaching at Garland Junior College in Boston. And I was teaching art on Commonwealth Avenue. Mm -hmm. It was uh, an elite school for young women who wanted to come to Boston and meet their Harvard husband. <laughs> I, I mean, how many <laughs> colleges have a course in how to manage your staff? <laughs> yeah, really. I, I, I started teaching there right after Tipper Gore had gone there. <laughs> and then she, of course, met Al mm -hmm. and, from Harvard, and they got married. And uh, so... The, the college couldn't really sustain this kind of lifestyle. And, and in the 70s, things got rough. So 1976, the college closed, and I was pretty much devastated that day. I went home, and my son, Tolan, uh, asked for a bedtime story. And I said, oh, I just lost my job. I don't really feel like telling a story tonight. He said, oh, come on, Dad, maybe it'll make you feel better. And he was right. So we started together modeling the story, and uh, I picked an aardvark because I thought they were very underserved in the world of children's literature. Mm -hmm. And then we named him Arthur, and um, he wanted me to draw a picture of him. And when I drew the picture, I realized that aardvarks had very long noses. And I thought, okay, maybe that's what my story will be about. And so that's how Arthur began. The very first Arthur story was about his nose. And when, when I was writing this new book, I went back and reread re the book, Arthur's Nose. And it ends with a sentence, there's a lot more to Arthur than his nose. And little did I know what was coming <laughs> down the pike for me. Uh, you know, this has been an amazing adventure. I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure. I, I wonder if teaching at that college where the expectation was that these women were coming here to meet their Harvard husbands, was there something in the back of your mind saying, women, there's a lot more to you than getting married to a rich guy? <laughs> <laughs> I, I did I love teaching so I, I missed that mm -hmm. and I had to make a choice about taking another teaching job or really going after what it was I wanted to try and do and that was write and illustrate books 
mostly illustrate books uh, because I never have thought of myself as an author. Uh, so I was waiting for great manuscripts to come my way. And the very first book I illustrated was uh, written by Isaac Asimov and a very prolific adult mm-hmm. author who wrote this book for kids called What Makes the Sun Shine. And, you know, I was terrified and delighted to be able to do this project. And I remember when the book was finished, I asked him, you know, well, what did you think? And he said, well, I didn't know what to think at first. And then I reverted to a six-year-old and I thoroughly enjoyed it. <laughs> it's great that he could do that, Absolutely, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We should all be able to revert to six-year-olds so quickly. <laughs> well, you know, I think that's one of the things that you're that you've created. You've created this tool that that's going to help lots of twelfth graders and college kids and moms and dads kind of remember what it was like being six years old, reading, uh, having Arthur being read to them. Yeah. Well, I used to be terrified of talking to large groups of people. And I started imagining them as six-year-olds out there in the audience. And I felt a lot more comfortable. And, you know, that re- that really helps. Mm-hmm. Rather than the underwear thing, you know, I, where I you're was, imagining everyone in their underwear. That's what it's got. You know, I do. I've been performing educational magic shows for 30 years. I never. Really? Yes, yes, yes. Oh. I never imagined my audience in their underwear. That, that would have been inappropriate. <laughs> But I think there's 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 something about that age, six years old. It's there's an honesty, and and there's something about you know when you have an eighth grader or twelfth grader who is able to kind of step back and just enjoy themselves as they would have as a six year old. There's a there's an honesty about them. They're they, they've kind of let down all the walls that they all the pretension. Yeah. All, and, and we've talked a lot here in the podcast, kids especially teenagers, they don't know who they are, so they feel that they have to pretend to be something yeah. else. And right. um, six-year-olds don't and, need that. And social media isn't doing them any favors. You know, um, I think about that all the time, how kids uh, struggle with social media because it's so it's such a powerful force in their lives and their social structure. Um, I, I often think if you know, if I get to do an Arthur movie, that would be a really interesting topic to uh, build a story around. Yeah, it really would be. When you think about that, um, how does Arthur deal with social media and the pressures and never being able to shut it off? Yeah, if he's just a little bit older, especially. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... It, it's obvious that even after 45 years and 25 years on TV, there's still a lot of energy. Uh, you still have a lot of, uh, of things to, to – places to take Arthur, it sounds like. We do, yeah. We want to begin uh, a podcast, and we want to look for other ways to reach out to kids and be helpful to them. So we're doing that. My son, Tolan, who heard that first Arthur story and has been one of the producers on the show for 20-some years, he and I and the head writer for Arthur are working on a new um, television series for kids, uh, younger kids. It's a lot of fun to uh, make up stories for preschoolers. I'm really having fun with this new project. I feel a little bit like I'm on parole. <laughs> <laughs> Having too much fun. <laughs> that's that's so neat. That's so neat. So can you give us a, a little um, taste of one of the stories that you're working on for the preschoolers? Uh, well, the main character is a little frog, and one of his legs is a little shorter than the other. And it's a world where these animal characters are, are children, and there are no adults. Uh, and the focus and the message of the series is the power of friendship and kindness. And, uh, you know, not unlike Arthur, where that is an underlying factor 
two, um, there are problems that the characters have to deal with, and it's how they solve them that's important. Um, and one of the stories is about um, a birthday party. Um, they uh, are having a, a planning a pancake party for their friend Philippa, and uh, Philippa is a little on the spectrum. Um, very um, creative uh, little squirrel. And she's kind of like an architect. She's built her own tree house and she has a studio up there in her tree house. And um, there's a thing that uh, the characters all meet at this old diner, which Hop and his sister Penny uh, run. And it's kind of like a clubhouse and they all come in there and, Hop is a little bit like a therapist and, you know, he helps kids, the, his friends deal with various problems they have. So they decide to put on this circus for Philippa. And, um, you know, six-year-olds making a circus is very different than what we think of as a circus. Uh, you know, Penny wants to walk the tightrope, but the tightrope is, tightrope is only this far off the ground and uh -huh. she's terrified. <laughs> And then uh, there is the Beaver family in town, and they are building things. They're ruthless. Um, you know, not unlike some people uh, that might have been president. <laughs> I don't, know. don't let me loose. All right. Uh, so they get wind of this circus, and they want to make a bigger, better circus. So they decide that they're going to come up with extravaganza. <laughs> And, uh, you know, it's a, a little over the top. Um, but it, the story ends um, in Philippa's tent. And it's a story tent. And she invites all her friends in there. And they're lying on the grass looking up at the ceiling. And she's painted this wonderful mural of things that she wants to do and things she imagines happening in the year to come. So uh, it, it, we're having a lot of fun with this. Yeah. And, uh, I'm excited about it. Um, and right now, uh, I'm missing a recording session this morning. They're recording uh, a, a trial um, episode. So anyway, too much information? Wow. No, 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 absolutely <laughs> not. This is great. I feel like we have a scoop here. This is wonderful. And I'm so honored that you took time off from that to be with us today. Sure. Um, you know, it's really, it's really weird, Mark, um, how the universe works. I, you know, I, I was telling you that I, I had the book last night, um, on the dinner table and I was reading, um, things from the PR folks. And then I had an interview with an author, Greg Howard, who wrote a book about a uh, name, The Visitors, a middle grade novel named The Visitors. And in the book, one of the characters is a ghost who died in the seventies, um, and he was gay. He was a young gay boy who, who died. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mar Greg started sharing with me his story of growing up in the South gay and how he was huh. afraid to tell his dad about it, mm -hmm. really worried about that. And when I picked up Believe in Yourself, what we learned from Arthur, the first page that I just kind of randomly opened it up. And the message on the page was there will always be a time in life when you think your parents are the opposite of who you are, but they're still a part of you and will always love you. And Greg was telling me that one of the most wonderful moments of his life was when he was 40 and was able to come out to his dad. Mm -hmm. And basically that was his dad's response was, well, I don't get it, but I love you mm -hmm. and you'll, I'll always love you. That's the right answer, dad. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And I, I love that Believe in Yourself has these pieces of wisdom for parents. I, I'm imagining a family sitting down together and, you know, the kids looking on one page at the illustrations and the quote from a, uh, from an Arthur book or from an Arthur cartoon and the, on the other side some wisdom that's really going to um, make parents think twice, I think. Don't you think of uh, picture books as kind of springboards for discussions? 
like you, you have this opportunity with your child on your lap or next to you and you're reading this book. You can stop at any point. And if you don't like what's happening in that story or you love what's happening, you can expand upon that and share your values with your child. And, you know, it's like that with TV, too. And um, my friend Fred Rogers uh, said, you know, that space between the book and the parent or the child and uh, between the television screen and the child is sacred. And we have to be very careful how we manage and navigate that space. Mm -hmm. And what I think Fred did it so beautifully. What a role model for all of us. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I, I think about that so often and, and the responsibility that we have writing and illustrating books or making TV shows mm -hmm. because kids deserve the truth. And yes. I, I think that um, they don't get it often enough. Yeah, they, they really don't. One of the things that, that kind of frustrated me is I've, you know, worked with people, you know, creating my magic. And um, sometimes you'd, you know, when you're creating by yourself, it can get a little stale and you kind of bring people in. And, hey, what do you think we should do? And everything that they came up with that was kid friendly was really boring and not very honest. Yeah. And I think when you're honest with kids, they they. They, they, can they know, that. Yeah. they know, absolutely. They have this magic sensor that can tell when they're not being told the truth. Um, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. Did you ever imagine back when Arthur was born that one day you'd be writing characters that were a little bit on the spectrum? <laughs> um. No, uh, and I never imagined doing television either. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I, I was terrified after I had agreed to work with PBS and WGBH in Boston to make this show. And, you know, we, I, I, my agent uh, built in a lot of approvals for the show, which I'm very grateful for now, uh, like approving the writers. I remember the first script that I was shown it's not good. Mm -hmm. And they said, but Mark, it's one of the best kids writers out in LA. And I, that, I mean, what am I supposed to do with that? You know, I still don't like the story. <laughs> <laughs> well, it might work in LA, but it's not working. <laughs> so, I, you know, I remember asking my wife, Lori, who is the smartest one in the family. She, uh, we kind of switched roles. She was uh, working at Harvard where she got her doctorate for many years with Howard Gardner, who uh, this brilliant man uh, who I, I love his theory of, of intelligence uh, and the way we measure intelligence is so primitive. But anyway, they ran this uh, project zero at Harvard, which is still thriving. And, um, Lori had a, a good psychology background, so I said, How, you know, what do I ask these potential writers? And she said, just ask them about their childhood. And that turned out to be the only question I really had to ask because it led them back. And I could tell whether or not they could get there. They could get back to their childhood because I think that's really one of the elements that makes a successful children's author is the ability to go back to your childhood. I, I can still see so clearly my third grade class with Miss Kingston up at her desk. I can smell the popcorn she used to make for our class. I remember when she got married that year and invited the whole class to her wedding. <laughs> what was she thinking? <laughs> I remember our principal, Mr. Haney, all of those memories became my life, Arthur. It's all there. They were all real people in third grade for me. Wow. So cool. I I have a memory from third grade, Mark. Uh, it was in the Arnold Arboretum. Ah, beautiful, beautiful. That's a good place to remember. It, it is. It is. And I didn't know before that day that I had severe allergies. And wow. I came out on one stage and 
of fl- of flowers, having fun running around with my buddies. And my third grade teacher, Mrs. Watanabe, started screaming because evidently my eyes were all blown out of my head and I was dripping. I had the same <laughs> thing growing up. Was it goldenrod? I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you, you shared awesome, some, some great advice. Uh, we have lots of authors who listen to the show. You, you, you shared being honest, you know, as in your writing and putting yourself back in that, that sixth grade place. Don't be, you know, I guess to paraphrase it, don't, don't be an, an adult writing for kids. Go back and be a kid and write from, <laughs> from your heart and your memory. Is there any other advice you can share the authors that are listening? To, to other authors? Mm-hmm. I'd rather hear their advice from me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I just, I, these, I don't know where these things come from. You know, I, I'll be uh, assigning myself, okay, I want to write a story about this. And then I just start working on it, and kids will say, well, you know, is it easy? No, it's not easy. You know, I'll do like 30 drafts of a story before I even send it to a publisher. And then the editor will make suggestions of changes, and it always makes the story better. Mm -hmm. But for me, the story is always a way to get to making the art. And uh, for people who are listening who write and illustrate books, uh, or people who are illustrating well, maybe everyone who's writing and illustrating. Here, my simple formula that I learned over the years is you are balancing this delicate scale where you have the words on one side, the pictures on the other, and the words should do what the pictures cannot, and the pictures should do what the words can. Like, if you... uh Say it was a beautiful morning and the sun was rising and it was a golden color. You don't need to say that, you know, other than maybe reference morning to give them a a place of time. But the illustrations should do that work for you. I'm always looking for ways to take away. I think less is more. Mm -hmm. I, I come from this picture book mentality where the words are precious and I want to use as few of them as possible because as a parent, I hated reading some of these books that had too many words that didn't mean anything. I'm not going to cite various popular authors who I had to edit while reading to Tolan and Tucker when they were younger. (laughs) Uh, Well, you know, I shared earlier on that your books have been part of my wife's classroom for forever. I can tell you, she is one quick way. She does quick reviews of all the books that, that show up um, unsolicited okay. at my door. She all right, lay it on me. What is it? She opens it up and she goes, too many words. <laughs> <laughs> I like her so much. <laughs> Give her a hug for me. <laughs> absolutely. I absolutely will. How many well, words? I, yes, yes. To just, you know. To, Don't you think it's a sign of insecurity? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let's put our therapist hats on. <laughs> I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'd be unprofessional. That's. <laughs> but, you know, as you're talking about, you know, I'm putting myself back and, you know, 29 years ago when my son was sitting on my lap and I didn't, it, when when he was five, he asked me to read Harry Potter and I, I agreed and that was a chore, <laughs> like 700 pages. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean... I didn't want the words to interfere with the conversations that I wanted to have with the kids. And yeah, absolutely, yeah. less was more. Less words equaled more conversations between me and my right. kids, and that was what was so valuable. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wow. This, you know, I'm I'm having so much fun, but I know you're too. <laughs> have have so much so much going on. Um, where can people go to find out more about Mark Brown, find out more about believing yourself, what we learned from Arthur? Uh, where can they go? Well, they can go to the Little Brown, or Hachette is the publishing umbrella under which Little Brown operates. So you can go to Hachette uh, and Google them. You can Google believe in yourself um, and see what happens. Uh, I don't do Facebook. Uh, I 
I said goodbye to them because I don't agree with a lot of their policies. I don't uh, tweet. Um, but I do have an Instagram account, and I would love for people to – it's very personal. And, you know, a lot of Arthur things, I love to post children's art. Uh, it's it's Mark Brown 333. So uh, visit me on Instagram. Awesome. And uh, fasten your seatbelt. <laughs> no, it's perfectly fine. Well, you know, I'm – I, I just I just can't resist I can't not share this with you. Um, you know, you're saying that you've had this great relationships with the folks over at WGBH, the public uh, broadcasting station here in yeah, Boston, wonderful. and now they refer to themselves as GBH, and yeah. <laughs> GBH stands for Great Blue Hill, and I can actually see the Great Blue Hill from my home here, and I'm looking out the window at it. There's a little oh, bit of I remember of hiking up there. It's beautiful. It is. It is. Yeah. Oh. And what else is beautiful is believe in yourself and all the work that has come from the mind and the hands of our guest, Mark Brown. Hey, Mark, thank you so, so very much for spending time with us. It's been a pleasure, truly. Please be sure to join us for the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Our guest will be Emma Otegi. She'll be here to celebrate Sophia Acosta Makes a Scene. That's the next episode of the show. Hey, please, please, please remember to visit our website, readingwithyourkids.com. Sign up for our free newsletter. Use the contact button to send us a message. And also check out our great certified great read wall of fame. I want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Chris, I want to start by thanking our guest, Mark Brown. Please be sure to check out Believe in Yourself, What We Learned from Arthur. A great book for anyone, no matter what stage of life they're in. This is a really fantastic book. I also want to thank my team, Alejandro Doherty, Fatima Khan, Rory Grady, Skylar Strauss. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, we want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of The Reading With Your Kids Podcast.